Well, the, the biggest one is water scarcity and uh, the dwindling amount of fresh water that's going to be available for people, uh, for irrigation, and for food production. So I would say that's number one. But uh, as I pointed out earlier as well, we also have the situation of floods, recent large floods uh, in many parts of the world, and how to uh, deal with flood control, how to manage excess water. And one could say that these uh, effects of increased drought, but also increased floods in other parts of the world um, could be caused by climate change. So I think these are the issues, the major ones that we're addressing at this point in time around the globe. Absolutely. I think, uh, and this was the point, one of the points I was trying to make in my presentation, storage I think is going to be absolutely critical in terms of uh, trapping some of that excess water, evacuating some of that excess water, putting it into storage, and then making it available during the dry season. Um, in places where that's possible, not everywhere is it going to be feasible, but we believe that uh, much more should be done on uh, putting water into storage and developing uh, more efficient, better water storage facilities. Yes. Well, the big one is finance, and that's what has hampered many countries, not just Canada, but several other countries, particularly in the African continent, is uh, the investment required. These are not cheap investments. And as you know, uh, small farmers, people who have two, three, four acres, five acres of land and even smaller, don't have the financial capability to invest in the uh, canals, the pipelines, the distribution network. In some cases, not they don't even have the capital to invest in the on-farm, the sprinkler systems or the drip systems. So I would say the biggest challenge or hurdle uh, in developing those storage systems, getting the water from where it's in storage to the people who need it, is the, the large investment required. And this will require some new type of public-private partnership model. It might mean people like the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation working with governments to help to do it because, and other large private uh, entrepreneurs, for example, the big chains, the Walmarts and the Costcos and so on, who are counting on f food supplies from these people um, might have to be some of the investors so to, to, be, to, to join partnerships. So, you know, we're looking at some uh, non-traditional methods of making these investments that are required. No, no. And that's a big educational effort. We need to get the private sector to the table. We need to get the Costco's and the Loblaws and the Walmarts and the Safeways to the table. And, and let them see what the magnitude of the problem is. Because right now, it's only their buyers who are meeting suppliers, and it's, that's the, the level at which it's operating. It hasn't been elevated up to the presidents of these companies saying, you know, I'm gonna get on top of this uh, and make some commitments and investments financially in those countries, because it's to my benefit to be able to have good, reliable supplies from those countries to meet my market demands. Huge. Political that political hurdle is probably in some ways bigger than the financial hurdle because we do see right now that there are people like the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation who are willing to come forward and make investments, the Buffett, uh, Warren Buffett and so on. Uh, those are the easy parts. But what we're not seeing is that the government's playing the role that they ought to be playing. And I think uh, that is going to be the biggest drawback in as we go forward. So the, the stability is a huge Huge. Issue. Political, and as you know, um, and nobody wants to make an investment. I mean, I, I, as I mentioned, because of the size of the investment required, you're going to need some of the non-traditional investors. You're going to need the large chains and the supermarkets to get involved in there. I mean, we know that Walmart and Costco are buying a lot of food from India and China, processing it and selling it in the grocery stores here in Canada. So they probably have a vested interest in helping some of those countries, but they're not gonna put their money into a country where they feel that there's a lot of political instability and so on. So I, I think you know that's something that we, uh, we have to think about. Yeah. 
absolutely critical. And you're, you're, I mean, you hit the nail on the head in that we don't have, those countries don't have, well, India and China do. They have the technology, they have the know-how. Africa doesn't have it all. Uh, they would have to rely on um, external capacity to provide the, the people and the skills to do it while they try to build up their own skills. Uh, so um, I would say some countries are better equipped. Indonesia has quite a bit of trained capacity, um, but certainly the African continent, a, a huge hurdle, and you're right, it's not just the investments, it's the people who have all the technical skills and the know-how and the policies, the policy knowledge to make it happen. I mean, one, one of the things that we haven't talked about, which is equally important, um, and, and this is why some people criticize um, previous projects, is they say that we put the money in up at the start to build these uh, projects, and then later on they become white elephants because the money isn't there to uh, maintain them, support them, things break down, they don't get repaired because the small farmer doesn't have the financial resources to put into those uh, infrastructures because they're so big. And, you know, I would say, to be honest with you, that is something that has not been given a lot of thought. So, on one hand, building it, but then what are the financial management models needed to keep them going on a permanent, sustainable basis? We have not addressed that. That needs a lot of serious thinking. But it also needs stable governments. It needs governments with a long-term commitment and view towards agriculture and water and food security. And until we have those kinds of governments in place who have that, that long-term vision, uh, I think we're going to be very, uh, very much in trouble to put these programs and, and projects in place. Um, a good point. Uh, I would say uh, water conservation, reuse of water, um, uh, excess water that you might have that you can redistribute. So it's water conservation, reuse, recycling, while we're getting the approvals and the financing uh, to put these big structures into place.